Last week I was down at a school in Radstock in uh, Somerset working with the children there and it's incredible now how interested in the key the kids are. I'm delighted they've now got horticulture back on the school curriculum. It actually is a very enjoyable um, um, living. In the old days, if you were thick like me, it'd be a gardener. And it never quite lost that title. Um, Alan, Alan Titchmarsh, should tell you, he was he, he really upset about it because it is a profession. It's a very honourable profession. It ain't a very wealthy profession, but that doesn't matter. If you enjoy what you're doing, that's the important thing. Um, my uh, gardening career started basically at the age of five. My dad was a keen garden. We had allotments and uh, garden with dad. And I started it, funnily enough, when I went to my first school. And it was a convent in Haywards Heath. And uh, uh, I was taught by nuns who masqueraded under the false title of Sisters of Mercy. <laughs> They absolutely hated my guts and I likewise hated theirs. And the only way they could control me, James, you're going in the garden. And they'd take me to the wall garden and there I'd spend the day with the old gardener, helping him pick, cut, do whatever else it was. Then the old boy gave me a slice of cake with his tea. I loved it. So each day when I was going to school, I thought, what can I do to upset them old bats to get me in the wall garden? And I remember one day, when the three of them got hold of me, I was playing up badly, the three of them got hold of me, and as we then marched me down to the wall garden, one of them said, you'll never go to heaven, you'll never meet Jesus. And as young as I was, I thought, if you're going to be there, I hope to God I don't go there. <laughs> but once I'd left there, I went to my next school, and there I was taught by Jesuits, and they were a lot tougher to crack than the nuns, and I didn't succeed. And at 15 and a half, my dad was summonsed, um, the headmaster said to him, look, you're wasting our money, your time money, you're wasting our time. So I left at 15 and a half, and that's all I've done ever since then, garden. And I mean garden. I'm not a horticulturalist, I'm not a consultant, I'm a gardener. I'm proud of the fact. And it's been a wonderful, wonderful life. I've been a lucky boy to be involved in something that basically has paid me a living. How many people can boast their hobby pays them a living? And in doing it, I also, as I said, just said I've been lucky because I looked after the, the Royal Parks. I looked after Hyde Park, Ken Gardens, St James's Green Park, Buckingham Palace, Clarence House and Kensington Palace uh, for the first 10 years. And then the last 15, I was the governor of a place that you all know just up the road. Greenwich Park, Naval College, Maritime Museum, Old Royal Observatory, Woolmer Castle, Dover Castle, Deal Castle and Elton Park as I have all the plants of the world. That's what he's fascinated by. Not how to grow them, certainly not weeding, hoeing <laughs> and uh, edging up, but where do plants come from? How do we get them? And on that subject, Tom really is no different to all those wonderful hunters of yesteryear. Mason, Lobb, Wilson, absolutely barking, set off with a peanut and a compass, and they've given us 80% of the flora that we have in this country from all flung corners of the world and if you come to Lullingston you'll see examples of what they brought back for us. The marigold for instance, where's it come from? Mexico, discovered by a hunter out there and look at the amount we've got now of the uh, French marigolds, the African, you name it. The dahlia, where did that come from? Mexico again. Hunter found it 25 foot high We've got it down there, a Dahlia imperialis, and it will flower, if you're lucky, at the end of September, at the top of 25 foot of growth in one year, the flower's about the size of a bee's knee, the most insipid, pathetic little pink flower. But from that granddad, we've got every Dahlia that we've got in this country now and everywhere else. And there are many, many other stories of plants that we've got from other countries that we've bred, hybridised and brought back here. But all my life, my pop taught me, and he was right, keep them on the ground, boy. Don't get big-headed. Just accept what you're given. Get on with it. So last year, we came to the end of the, uh, uh, the season with uh, Tom's last show. And it was uh, a craft fair and a plant fair. 
and uh, Tom, as I say, is not an organised person. And I said, Tom, we've got to mark the pitches out. No, 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 Jesus, that'd be all right. They're fine when they want it. I said, yeah, they'll all go in one corner. We want to spread it. So, marked all the areas out. And I stay down there when we're really busy like that. The next morning, six o'clock the Sunday morning, before the vehicles are arriving, we're just having a cup of tea and a bit of porridge. Right, I said, Tom, who have you got doing the car park today? Tom, did you hear what I just said? Sorry, Jimmis, I, I, I forgot to ask Fred. I said, all oh, right. So I put the yellow jacket on, and now uh, the cars are arrived. Come on, come on, come on, in the field opposite. Then the next one, next one, all the lot. And this woman got out, smiled at me, and when she went down to pay her money, she said, excuse me, that bloke doing the car parking, was he that judge in the Great Allotment Challenge? And the girl said, yes, he was. Oh, she said, I suppose like all actors, he's out of work at the moment. <laughs> But, as I say, getting back to your own competition, if anybody's got any questions, whether I can answer them or not is another matter, but I'm, I'll willingly have a go. And, of course, he talked earlier, the gentleman, I've forgotten his name. Russell. 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 Yeah. Um, he talked earlier about um, the radio. And the radio, I, I've, I've heard recorded, I can understand that, Mr Middleton, Gordon Bennett. See, the thing is, with radio, you've got to have a voice. No good having a pretty face. And I do a lot of radio work, and actually, you know, I am, uh, th th that's my face, my voice. People can hear you, they get to know the, the lulls, the highs, the lows, as he rightly said. And I do it for uh, BBC Radio, Surrey, Sussex and Hampshire. And the lady, uh, was it the lady that made that crack about me? Uh, no, it was one of the gentlemen on radio. Steve Bradley. Because yeah. they do Radio Kent and they both do Sussex with me. And you heard what he said. Somebody rang up and said, we're celebrating 100 years of our estate. Could you name the plants that are doing it? And she'd already said, but Jim Buttress is coming down. They said, ask him. He was around then. Thanks a lot. <laughs> But radio is a very, very powerful media, there's no doubt about it. We pull in on uh, BBC Radio Surrey, Sussex and Hampshire about uh, four and a half million listeners in the area on a Sunday morning. It's called Dig It. And my first into radio was with the uh, LBC, the London Broadcast uh, Mob, and Therese Birch was the presenter, and it used to go out on a Saturday lunchtime, and it was called Weekend Matters and there'd be me, there'd be a DIY expert, and there was somebody on mechanics. And we all took a turn each week of giving the advice and dirty, dirty, dirt. So we're on there, and uh, the presenter said to me, Trace, she said, Jim, I think we can nick another question before we go to the uh, news, weather, and uh, roads, you know, traffic, that was the word I was thinking of. All right, so it's Fred. Fred from uh, uh, Croydon and he said Jim I think I know the answer but I really want you to just confirm it I've got a tree in the front garden and it's it's really looking sick it hasn't done anything for two or three years I said what was it Fred he said it was a cherry tree I said no doubt it's got canker passed its sell by date I think you know what to do thanks a lot Jim grateful so we then swing in to the the news and they read all the news out in the next studio then they went to the weather, and this is God is my judge. When they got to the traffic report, they said, avoid the Croydon area, there's a tree down across the road. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's a great way of people coming in and asking. But the BBC, the Dig It one, that's on a, a Sunday morning, the three hours on, uh, we do it from Guildford uh, University. And it was Jean Griffin who does Kent, said when they were short of somebody to come on, um, well, I know a bloke, he'll, he'll, he'll grab it. So they got me down there and they said, well, we'll give you a trial. Um, obviously, we want to see whether you fit in with us and the people I heard all the rest. OK. So I've gone down there and the bloke give it a build-up, extra all parts, dirty, dirty, dirt, Jim Buttress. Morning, Jim. Morning, Joe, how are you? And uh, have we got a caller? And you see it come up on the screen. Bloke rang up, he said, I don't know who you're talking about, this Jim Buttress. He said, uh, he sounds just like, uh, what's his name, Hopkins, the, uh, the actor. Um, Hoskins, isn't it? Bob Hoskins. Bob Hoskins. They said he sounds just, no, 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 it's Jim Buttress. All right, fair enough. Then they thought I was that bloke from the, uh, 
um, what was his name now? Oh, it'll come back to me in a minute. And somebody else. None of them would accept that to a Ray Winston. That was the other. They said, it's Ray Winston. I didn't know you were a gardener, Ray. And I keep saying, no, 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 it's Jim Buttress. Well, it, in a way, it got me the jobs. I've been there five years now. But it's, it's fascinating listening to what people want. And it is that basic advice. I think one of the problems with that Great Allotment Challenge was they tried to do too much. And what most people wanted was the basics. How do I do this? When do I do that? What's wrong with this? And um, I'm already in discussions with another company to probably produce a programme maybe next year. It'll be too late this year because I think that one's finished. Um, uh, they're not going to do another episode, series of it. It's fair enough. Um, and we're in discussions now as to doing an actual on the plot and starting with the cooch, the nettle, the thistle, all the crap the bloke left behind before and raised beds and the whole likes of it. So we'll just wait and see if it happens. And because of that, as I said, the, the extra work I've got is fascinating. Uh, the last two days I've down in Worcestershire at a, a college called Pershaw and they've got a big theatre there and we did an evening of uh, reminiscing and stories and what have you. So, as I say, I've been a very, very lucky lad. Now, anybody want to ask any questions? I will do my best. They haven't even got to that stage yet. Gentlemen said, where's it going to be filmed? They're just talking, and they do a lot of that. <laughs> I mean, when they originally asked me if I'd go for an audition for the uh, Great Allotment Challenge, I had to go to a studio up in, just off Tottenham Court Road. I mean, a lot of gardening up there, isn't there? And uh, they said, obviously, we need to do an audition with you, and just wondered if you'd do a bit of judging. And I said, oh, where have we got to go for that? No, we'll actually do it here. And then the girl picked up a Tesco's bag and took out some onions and some carrots and said, can you judge them? Anyway, I did that, and then eventually they agreed to let me go on and do the series. It was just incredible. But they're at least talking about one. It's a pity because the site we filmed the other one was is a place called Maple Durham, which is situated just outside of Reading, a place called Cavanham. And it was, well still is, a stately home. Unfortunately, the, uh, the wall garden that went with it, gone. And then the BBC reopened it, did it all up, and now they've got a, a pack of good set down there. So whether they could nick the same set I don't know. But uh, when I find out, you'll, you'll hear about it. I mean, I have to say, it was, sorry, it was a lot of... I like the lad, the lad that did the flower arranging, Jonathan. I mean, a very colourful character, but they normally are when they're flower arrangers, aren't they? But I heard them very well with him. But I'm afraid I did not knit it off with that, the preserve lady. <laughs> Hello. I'm a lot of trouble with moss growing all over the grass. Yeah. And how can I get rid of it? Move. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> the thing about it, you've got a lot of moss on the garden. Have you got a lot of uh, overhanging trees and shrubs and everything? Yeah. 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 The thing about the lawn is it needs to be light and airy. It wants to have plenty of light and air around. The more stuff you have hanging around it, when it rains, drops down, settles down, there's no light coming through, it's damp, moss, thank you very much indeed. So without napalming all the shrubs around it, if you can reduce them back a bit, you've done that. But it literally, it, 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 it's literally a, law, a garden of moss. The trouble with it is that, I mean, yes, you can scarify, you can rake, you can feed burb at a burb at a burb, but if it's as bad as you say it is, could you bear starting again? I think I'll have to. Yeah. Yeah. And turf rather than seed. Okay. If you seed it, you know, at least with turf, acts as a blanket and keep the moss down. But the biggest encouragement to moss is, dare I say it, negligence of the lawn in the first place the treating of it the looking after it and it's a bit like you know you keep a dog and you don't comb it regularly it gets scruffy you've got to keep brushing that out but i think the state you've got it in bless you darling i think it i've been there 30 years it's just dark and dry so yeah 
right. No, exactly. We haven't had bad value for it in 30 years, have you? <laughs> but no, what I, what I do is to say is to get that off, get the top off, or get somebody to do it for you, and then turf it. And quite honestly, any time between now and the end of March, April, is a good time to turf.